to hand outs on the on the different uh, recreational areas and uh, we couldn't find Scotia anywhere in the map and we had one of the nicest places here so I got with Steve and said we ought to do what we can do to, to uh, get the mines open again for the educational and historical value that's there uh, let alone the scenery so that's kind of how we got started on here uh, there's a lot of history here uh, Steve's pretty pretty much the historian on this I'll let him tell you a little bit about Happy Jack back in the in early 1800s, about mid 1800s, uh, Happy Jack Swearinger was a trapper and a fur trader. He come north out of Grand Isle, and uh, he established a site right here on the Happy Jack's Peak, as we call it as of today. He uh, embedded a, a soddy on one of these ridges here, is part chalk and part soddy, and so he could go in underground as well as as go on surface. Uh, in 1877. Uh, the first people that come up through here were the soldiers to settle Fort Hartsuff, and he guided them up through here and, and established the area where Fort Hartsuff is today. And then the second group of people that come through here was the Seven Day Adventist, and uh, he showed them up through here as they were passing through. Most of the people come from Grand Isle area and uh, come north from there, and they were told to stop here at this given area that Happy Jacks would take them on or, or guide them and show them where they'd like to establish their given areas. And uh, they called him Happy Jacks for one reason. He was just happy to see people. He was a big man. He stood about 5'8 at that time, and he's blonde-haired and blue-eyed. And that was the biggest comment about him. He was just happy to see people come. And he's glad to greet him. It was a well, well-deemed stopover point, and this is where they generally generated people here. And from here, they left to different areas of, through the valley and up through the country. But uh, it was all established back helped establish too due to the fact that the railroad had come through here and and, uh, and they'd had land sales out here and homesteading deals and he helped out on that part too. And this here project we're trying to get hope, get it started so we can have a wayside recreational area and uh, Ken and me got to talking about this this last previous summer and uh, we were talking about how we could develop the area for recreational and to help the community of Scotia. Verlin Barnes. I'm the coordinator for the Loop Basin RCND office, and RCND stands for Resource Conservation and Development. And our office covers a nine-county area here in central Nebraska. And our our focus is on the betterment of communities, and we assist with environmental, economic, and social issues. We are governed by a local board of concerned individuals who make the decisions and decide what are the priority issues that we will work on. Um, as far as the Chalk Mine Association, um, Steve Goldfish came to my office in August of this year, 1996, and asked if there was anything the RCND could do to assist him. He was interested in reopening the mine because it was of interest to him when he was a child and teenager in this area. He used to run around it quite a bit and, and I did too. I was from Ord at that time and so I knew of it and I knew that it was a benefit to the area. Um, so I worked with him a little bit and then we brought the project proposal up to the tourism committee of the Loop Basin RCND and they were very much in favor of seeing something done to reopen this mine and capitalize on the scenic view and the his history of the area. Um, after that, we brought the full the project proposal to the full RCND Council, and they as well were enthousi enthusiastic about the project, and so they did adopt it as well. And what the RCND does is worked with works with grassroots individuals on projects, and it kind of fills in the blanks where those individuals don't know where to go to to make a contact here or there or how to get something done 
We try to fill in the blanks. Um, we have helped them develop the articles and incorporation for their nonprofit organization, the Happy Jack Chalk Mine Association. Um, we've helped with the bylaws, and we plan on helping with the 501c3 application. And we've helped make contacts through the state agencies and some federal agencies to get assistance as they need help to get this project done. Um, the project is important be for historic reasons and recreation reasons, as well as economic development. It, I think it can play a role in bringing in some tourism dollars into the local economy and boosting the local communities and giving them a way to diversify their economy. Grab the teeth. Don't try to break off the guns. Too much. My price is to rub my teeth on there. Right there. My towel grab it. I'm uh, Al Dunbar. I'm on the Lower Loop NRD board. And uh, when the RCND was uh, organized, I was uh, uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't I wouldn't say I was drafted, but I was uh, um, since I lived locally, I was uh, chosen as the one to represent the Lower Lower Loop NRD on the RCND Council. And uh, since it was organized, uh, I, I have been on the RCND Council. And uh, the, the NRD is, uh, is definitely interested in, uh, in anything that is for the, the benefit of uh, the community and the area. And uh, for that, uh, that reason, I, uh, and uh, I have personal interest in it. Uh, and uh, the NRD at this point is, uh, uh, it has offered uh, uh, a little more than lip service. They, they are in favor of the, uh, <clears throat> of the, the chalk mine development. But uh, at this point that, uh, the fact that we are in favor of the uh, continued development and uh, we, uh, we go from there. And uh, the fact that I am on the RCND Council gives, uh, gives me that much more interest in the, in the proposition. And uh, we, uh, we do, uh, as I say, we are in favor of anything that is for the betterment of the uh, of the community, and uh, in my opinion, this is a, a proposal that uh, des <clears throat> deserves more attention than it has. Uh, these people uh, have uh, uh, have had uh, local, uh, I think, possibly misunderstanding as to what uh, is to take place here, and. Uh, as time goes on and uh, people uh, are made aware of what uh, is proposed here, and uh, I, I think their uh, time is probably the main uh, main thing they need now, and to get uh, get this better publicized in the in the local area, and uh, that uh, take it from there. But I, I don't see any major obstacles in their in their way at this time. It gets taller as you come back in. About five foot, you can stand up.
I'm uh, Kevin Gustafson with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in O'Neill, Nebraska. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. Uh, we are we got involved in this project. Uh, the RCND in this area is interested in uh, developing this area of the I believe this is called the Happy Jack Chalk Mine into a, like a highway wayside area. Highway 11 is just to the side of us up here and uh, I was contacted by the office in St. Paul, Nebraska to do a survey of the mine area. Uh, that that office had performed a survey of the above ground area prior to my getting involved. So that's the what? just received in our agency. Uh, the original survey of the uh, above ground surfaces were done with the theodolite using our uh, old conventions. We've used the total station on this survey, and basically what we can do is by using uh, known points from the original survey and tying those into our total station survey, we're we will be able to take these this survey and incorporate it into the above ground survey and be able to show on a plan planometric map where these mine shafts are located underground even though they aren't visible from above ground. So that's basically what we were doing in this part of it is to show, we will be able to not only, like I mentioned before, show the location of the mines horizontally uh, in relation to the above ground surfaces, we will also be able to show a profile through the uh, mine shaft area, which will show both the, the above ground and the bottom or the mine shaft portion which will give or show what the amount of uh, earth above the mine shafts is in a graphical sense. the mine and I can't be exactly the, uh, to the dates but uh, from somewhere around 1942 to 1946 uh, at that time I would have been in the age bracket of uh, 11 to uh, 15 years old uh, I helped my dad in the mine not as a uh, hired employee but so much as uh, you know, just helping out when they needed a little extra help or coming down on a, a day off from school or something like that and helping in there uh, memories that I have of the mine, of course, are the fact that it was uh, always uh, essentially the same temperature. There's some, something my father enjoyed very much, and the fact that he had a warm place to work in the, in the uh, wintertime and a, a cool place to work in the summertime. It was backbreaking work because there was no automation of any kind, no mechanical uh, assist, really. It was all just brute strength and awkwardness uh, from barring the uh, lower portion of the uh, chalk rock main off in, in order to set charges above for it to fall down. Uh, all this was done with uh, improvised tools that were made from uh, old uh, axles from Model T's or Model A's with a blade put on by a local uh, hardware man or a blacksmith. Uh, the drills that they used were just sent essentially carpenters uh, braces and they had the uh, blacksmith linking out and, and uh, take a regular wood bit and uh, make it a, a reach of about, I'll say 30 inches probably. Uh, from this, they bored into the uh, soft rock. Uh, they made a kind of a cigarette charge, you might say, uh, from uh, a sheet of a Sears and Roebuck or Montgomery Ward catalog. And they wrapped this around a, a broom handle and, and uh, uh, formed, uh, twisted the end shut, and poured it full with a little uh, can full of black powder, stuck it in this hole that they had drilled along with the fuse and, and uh, then they took the small chunks of rock that uh, had laid on the floor that were soft and they tamped this in there to make a tight thing so that it would uh, blow the rock down. Then they would simply light this fuse and step around the corner and wait till there was a wonk and, and uh, the rock came down. 
Then they just physically barred it into uh, chunks that they could uh, physically lift and put into an old Model A uh, truck. It was a, a, a little dump truck. I suppose today's standard would be about a quarter ton capacity. This thing uh, had no cab. It had been chopped off so it would uh, run down the uh, shaft of the mine or this horizontal shaft and not hit the ceiling. And then they would load this rock uh, that they had blown down and take down to a point approximately uh, a mile from here, uh, which was a siding for the, from the railroad company. And there they physically uh, loaded a, uh, a grain car from the railroad uh, with wheelbarrows. And uh, then it was shipped uh, to United Grain Company in, in Omaha. I'm sorry, it wasn't United Grain. It was United Mineral Company in, in Omaha. I couldn't be sure what all the uses were at that time. Uh, serving on memory, I understood some went to feeds, uh, some went to uh, paint. I'm sure there are many other uses that they uh, used for this or used this for. Uh, at the tail end of the operation of the mine, uh, my feeling and in my memory uh, that the reason they quit mining uh, at that time was the fact that United Mineral had open pit uh, limestone quarries in, down in the Weeping Water area and it was just uh, more economical and more feasible to uh, get their source uh, of materials, uh, their supply of materials from that uh, source down there. Uh, really, uh, as far as the danger of the mine, I, I don't really know of any uh, great uh, threat or any feel of danger that uh, my dad or any of the people that helped him had. Uh, once in a while, if a uh, particular shaft or alleyway, if you will, got too wide, then there would be the possibility of the ceiling uh, part sloughing off and falling down. It seems to me that one time uh, my dad was telling about that they were back in there and this had happened and they had to, of course, uh, move this material out of the road. It didn't physically fall on them, but it prevented them from coming out with the uh, vehicle to, to get back out that night. In the When they initially started uh, mining uh, here, uh, I think the concept was to, to make the uh, shaft way, way too wide, or the, the area they were getting way, way too wide. And they abandoned this because that was unsafe. Uh, because of this falling off from the ceiling and falling down. Uh, from that point on, from the entrance of the mine, uh, kind of at a, about a 45 degree angle to the right and also to the left is where they created these two large of, uh, cavities. Uh, from that point on, they went straight back with uh, the mine uh, shaft being approximately uh, a comfortable width for the Model A uh, dump truck to uh, uh, go back and forth in. In later years, as far as danger, uh, when there was a kind of a rehab uh, thing uh, to open the mine to tourists and become a state wayside area, uh, they cleaned out these areas that were unsafe, thinking this was uh, kind of a grand room or something of this nature, and they put picnic tables and things like this in, which was probably the most dangerous thing they could have done at that time. Other than that, uh, there just didn't seem to be the amount of danger that one might associate with mining or uh, thinking of being underground in this respect. In, in various areas around this area, you can see limestone uh, outcropping. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, of this particular uh, mine, there was a vein that was used that was of a different consistency than the rest of the limestone. What dictated it, uh, how high they went was the uh, uppermost part of this vein of real soft chalk rock that was very, you could feel it uh, with your fingers. And when you got to the roof area, it was uh, more gritty. And then also on the floor. So this, uh, this may be a reason why this was more popular or used more than the rest. Probably it held together better and, and so on. It is, uh, you know, as far as economics and, and things passed, which is only hearsay as far as I'm concerned or that I know is that uh, it was used to construct some buildings. It was used for uh, blocks, for foundations, basements, and, and this thing. Uh, I would imagine because of the consistency of this particular vein and the ease of uh, getting it into the block size that a person needs for construction, 
might have been part of the reason it, it was used. Uh, my wife and I own a uh, building in town that's the only one that I know of that exists is the uh, Chalk Rock building. It's uh, the building that's 22 foot wide, uh, probably about uh, 70 feet long, with sidewalls approximately uh, 12 foot high. And this thing was constructed, I think, in 1878. So uh, the idea of using the mine and the economics of it and, and the different uses of the material uh, goes on for well over 100 years. individuals regard the chalk mines as a touchstone in their personal histories. Memories of a Sunday afternoon, climbing the hill to enjoy the spectacular view, or the excitement of going underground to explore the painstakingly carved caverns. Others regard the operations which took place there as a historical snapshot, as well preserved as the ancient newspaper still found in the powder holes once prepared for blasting. The Happy Jack Chalk Mine Project has enjoyed tremendous volunteer support and technical assistance from local as well as area citizens and organizations. Articles of incorporation for the organization have been filed with the help of Earl Alshweed, a Grand Island attorney, paving the way for future fundraising efforts to further develop the recreational and historical aspects of the mine. Area natural resources and conservation have helped coordinate a topographical and interior survey of the mine site. The Lower Loop NRD Board has further endorsed efforts. Kathy Kuzak of Loop City and Eternal Frames Video of Aurora have made an ongoing photographic and video record of the site and related activities. Tim Williams, a Grand Island engineer, has drafted a new design for the stairway to the peak, which recently received a new cross marker at its summit. The Village Board of Scotia has given full support to the effort. North Loop Scotia students environmentally aware have developed a survey to get further input on the project and are working to develop a promotional informational slideshow. Steve Goldfish, Ken Bloom, Nick Clement, Sue Hansen, Kathy Kuzak, and Charles Beebe, members of the Happy Jack Chalk Mine Board, have worked to realize the dream, which has enjoyed so much grassroots support. Your continued donations of time and effort, as well as financial support, will help ensure that the Chalk Mine legacy extends to yet another generation. Yeah.